The following program is a presentation of the Interfaith Broadcasting Commission. After Julie was killed, the absolute rage and revenge that went through me was was gripping. I couldn't cry, but I I don't know, I couldn't say it, I was just still for a minute, like, dang, she's dead. So then I said, ten child murderers would have to die, and I would have to pull the trigger. And I pulled it ten times, and I felt really good. <laughs> it was a delicious feeling, and that's when I realized with horror where I had gone, and the, and the kind of anger that I was capable of. One of the uh, sheriffs took a, uh, a pistol, uh, put it inside of my head, and, and, and pulled the trigger. In my mind, I was a dead person. I thought, how dare they do that? How dare they salute one? that their grandfathers had killed. These people are all on a journey, a path they didn't choose. In this program, we will hear extraordinary stories from ordinary people, families who've had to deal with how to go on with life after experiencing terminal illness, violence, or murder. In our first story, we meet a couple who had to face the most difficult situation any parent could face. The beauty is that we haven't lost Candace's memory. Wilma and Cliff Dirksen of Winnipeg, Manitoba, were the parents of three active children. Their ordinary life took a terrible turn when the oldest, Candace, was 13. When Candace left school on November 20th, 1984, she was headed home for supper. The manager of this corner store, a few blocks away, remembered seeing her that afternoon. But her trail went cold after that. A search committee was formed, and her classmates canvassed the neighborhood with posters. It was a very cold night. I think the, the, the temperature had dipped to around 22, 25 below that night. Then seven weeks after Candace went missing, she was found. Her body was in this little used shed in an area that had been searched several times by police and volunteers. It was sort of a roller coaster day, but I think we were totally unaware of what would happen next until around 10 o'clock that night. A man knocked on their door. I, I recognized the man, but I had no way of placing him and then realized that when he introduced himself that he was the father of a murdered daughter. And he came in offering to come in and share with us what lay ahead for us now that we were the parents of a murdered child. We just were horrified because we realized what our new identity would be. And he told us about his life and his experience of losing his daughter. Two hours. In vivid detail, he told us absolutely everything that had happened to him and how it had totally destroyed his life. He uh, demonstrated and expressed a lot of anger, desire for revenge. It had ruined his health, his ability to work, his family relationships. The worst thing, he said, about this whole thing is that it has also destroyed the positive memories of his lost daughter. And that's when I, I couldn't... I couldn't take very much more. I just, but is that is that really what this is going to happen to us? When Wilma and I went to bed that night, we we discussed this. We had seen the new enemy, and we knew it was different than the first one, the one that Candace had dealt with. And so we resolved that we were going to do it together. We were going to hang in there. We were going to, and we chose the word forgiveness. And, and I think that comes from our faith. I can't say at this point that I forgive this person. I don't know, this person is a faceless person. So, but I know that when it does happen, I hope I can forgive. It was a very deliberate choice, and I don't think we knew what it meant. <laughs> One of the things we've learned about forgiveness is that it is a very complicated process. It is not an easy thing. It is not something that is done once and is finished. 
In the months and years following, Wilma wrestled with how she felt about the killer. One day, a good friend discussed this with her. She says, what would it really take? Would it be capital punishment to give you the equity and the justice? And my response to her was, no, it wouldn't be enough for one man to die, because he would be dying for what he did. Candace was innocent. So then I said, 10 child murderers would have to die. And it still wasn't enough. I still didn't feel that deep satisfaction. And then I said, and I would have to pull the trigger. And I pulled it 10 times, and I felt really good. <laughs> it was a delicious feeling. And that's when I realized with horror where I had gone and the, and the kind of anger that I was capable of. Eventually, Wilma's journey through grief motivated her to begin a program called Victim's Voice. She coordinates meetings of victims and offenders at Stony Mountain Prison, where victims can ask the questions that rarely get answered during a trial. And, and that's, so, that's so common in victim stories, whereas the public never knows all the other details that never... On one occasion, Wilma visited Stony Mountain Prison to ask the prisoners her own questions. And they were all lifers or somebody who had been violent. And um, the first hour was most, it was the most amazing encounter. Of course, I was terrified, just terrified, and there were no guards. It was only later that Wilma realized there had been 10 men in the room, and that she no longer had that urge to squeeze the trigger. When I could honestly see them as human beings who had made tremendous mistakes. I know that I can never make up for what I've done and never replace, you know, um, the life that I've taken. But see their agony and see that a lot of them couldn't even face what they had done. I could feel compassion. I had to go through uh, whether I was willing to accept what I did, you know, take responsibility for my crime. And that compassion was redeeming for me. Then I realized I had achieved some of the forgiveness, so I, I still don't ever claim to be totally victorious. <laughs> Through her work, Wilma met Rennie de Roche, who served a long sentence and now himself helps those incarcerated. And I'm just amazed that someone had reached a point in life to give that give and forgive. Today, the Dirksons live ordinary looking lives. Even though they've experienced a murdered family member, the bleak future that was predicted the night Candace was found has not happened because of the choices they've made. Thank you for this time that we can do together. We're all serving life sentences for something. You know, death has been at my dinner table every day. I think it, it does make me think more about death than the normal person, just because it's been there. But, but it doesn't consume me. It's like she's gone for a trip and, you know, there will be a reunion in the end. So, so we're looking forward to that, all of us are. The beauty is that we haven't lost Candace's memory. It's amazing how 15 years later I can still feel her presence. And her, and her joy. I think what happens after death is that, that you're, you're never quite at home on the surface you have been. Candace isn't out of our lives. She's still very much in it. And um, we, we can go any place on this earth. We don't have to avoid. We can, if it is painful, like even now, even if it is painful, we can go here and we can come out feeling better for it and having learned something. And I think that's really what healing is. Wilma and Cliff's journey has been exceedingly difficult, but their memories and their faith sustain them. Hospices around the country help terminally ill patients and their families deal with grief and dying. In this process, workers and patients confront a range of forgiveness issues. 
forgiveness is a, a very mature way of accepting that the world is not perfect. Ira Bayak, a medical doctor at the forefront of the hospice movement in Missoula, Montana, has done extensive work on dying and forgiveness. That we are not perfect and neither is the other person. And, and moving on. It doesn't let them off the hook. Uh, it simply helps us to get sort of unstuck. In Tampa, Florida, Life Path Hospice serves more than 3,700 persons a year. Robert Glass is a hospice chaplain there who struggles through forgiveness issues with patients and survivors. Today, he's visiting Nathaniel. Nobody comes by to say, here's a drop of water, or here, I'll fix you some tea. If hospice didn't come to see about me, I would have nobody to come see about me. Nathaniel is terminally ill at age 53. His elderly mother took him home from the hospital, fully expecting he would die. And after about a year, she died. Rocked his world. After his mother died, Nathaniel and his brother had a terrible rift. I want him to be here with me. I want him to share this pain. Okay, I want him to ease this pain because only he can do that for me. Only he can do that for me. I need him. Sometimes I just sit, Reverend, and I just cry because there isn't anything that I can do. My hands are tied. I mean, there isn't anything else that I can do to ask my brother to bring his love back to me. I mean, I love him. I'll, I'll, I'll always love him. It's still a pain in his heart right now. Dear God. And most of the time we go, we talk about it. He said, I'm still having this problem. He said, well, we'll pray about it, we'll pray about it. As well as the days and Lord, we ask that your peace, your love, Father, your forgiveness, Father, and your reconciliation be brought upon this family right now. Thank you so much, Father. God bless you. Thank you very much. I think forgiveness is actually a very um, sophisticated emotional strategy for caring for ourselves. Um, because when there is anger, uh, and a feeling of retribution, perhaps. Um, it's really uh, uh, ours, uh, and it keeps us stuck. It's hard to move beyond that sort of anger. Life Path Hospice offers survivors and families a variety of aftercare activities to help them deal with the painful emotions of the grief process. It's a very, 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 very important portion of what we do. It's called bereavement. The aftercare process includes telephone calls, counseling, support groups, and children's and family camps for survivors. Dion and her family attended one of Life Path's family camps one year after an accident that took 14-year-old Ashley's life. Their grief is still very fresh and raw, the tragedy too close to consider forgiveness. I knew when I heard the knock on the door that I didn't want to answer that knock on the door. Ashley was at a slumber party when she and some friends got in a car with a driver they didn't realize was drunk. I knew something was wrong and I walked out and my living room door is glass on the top so you can see and I looked out and Jody's mother and another woman were standing there and I just threw myself on the ground and started screaming. I couldn't even open the door. I knew she was dead. I knew she was dead when the knock came on the door. The three teens in the back seat were killed on impact with a utility pole while the driver and his front seat passenger survived. I don't have forgiveness for the driver of the car, none at all. To purposely drive recklessly. They were begging to be let out of the car. They were pleading. Waving it in their faces. He didn't show any mercy to those kids when they were begging to be let out. So I shall not show any mercy to him. That I don't think is something I'll be able to forgive. Uh, I'm really torn on the thing how I was brought up turning the other cheek. You know, I can't do that in this case. Right, come on, get in, JJ. That's the way I was brought up. Bereavement follow-up is, is absolutely uh, essential so that the bereaved can go on living, and uh, they need support to do that. They've been through um, a very, very traumatic um, event that doesn't end with the death of their loved one. I couldn't cry, but I, I don't know, I couldn't say, and I was just still for a minute, like, Dang, she's dead. What's life going to be like now? I was very worried about my sons, being as they're teenagers. I've heard the statistics when teenagers lose a sibling, lose a close friend. It's a very dangerous time. When my sister had died, I, I realized that it could be anyone. 
And I realized that it could be me, it could be anyone in my family. There are, of course, 15 and being the men, you know, holding up, being strong for mom. But they're grieving, they're hurt. And um, they went to the youth camp back in May. They didn't want to go. They were too old for stuff like that. When they came back from the camp, they had made many new friends, friends that they had something now in common with. They have to go on with their lives, but it's last night they had their homecoming. And as they were all dressed up in their tuxedos and getting in the limo, it's like, where's their sister? She should be between them. And she's not. Everything, every joyful moment we have together as a family is bittersweet now. And it will be for the rest of my life. We're not supposed to outlive our children. You know, we're not supposed to outlive her or live her. She should be here. We had so many plans and so many things we were going to do together. And she's not here to do them now. If hospice wasn't here, I wouldn't have had any idea where to turn. They've been absolutely wonderful. You can call them anytime, day or night. There's always somebody available to talk to you. They get very involved in helping the family heal. In Missoula, Montana, Ira Biox research gave birth to the Missoula Demonstration Project. The project is a citywide effort to explore how to make the end of life better for the whole community. A number of us in Missoula came together to talk about what it, what it would look like to use our community as a laboratory of experience to explore ways of, of taking back the end of life to reintegrate dying within the fabric of human life as individuals, families, and communities. The community is important because unless we're all working at this together, it won't happen. What's surprising is that it has caught on remarkably in the community. And instead of people rolling their eyes and, you know, saying, what? You know, they have said, boy, what a great idea. Our research has shown that many people um, have never had the opportunity to talk about end-of-life things at their, around the kitchen table with their family. In this day and age, it's not uncommon to find a 50-year-old who's never experienced a dying process. Dying okay. ruptures community. It takes a person from among us, and it leaves people behind who are going to grieve that person. So there's a sense in which a community will always need to find ways to heal itself after a loss. Sometimes it takes another person in the community to initiate the healing process. Certainly, um, I've heard some wonderful stories about family members who reached out to um, a disengaged child and said, you know, why don't you come with me over to talk with your father? and we will, and we'll see how it goes. Sometimes um, when you're disengaged, you don't even realize that you, this is the opportunity, maybe your last opportunity, or you're just too afraid. And you need that, that friend, that pastor, that someone in your circle who'll say, I'll go with you. Susie Risho directs a program called like Story Keepers, share. which helps preserve the stories of the elder generation. What was that? I found out that a kid can fly when he has to. Or Don found out a kid can fly. I hear all over the country people are appreciating stories more. Stories are as old as we are, as the human race. Where I was going to land, there was a rattlesnake. And so I tread there like you tread water, you know. Move those Story Keepers really is an offshoot of the Missoula Demonstration Project, which began several years ago. And one of their and, uh, many task forces was Virgil, on how Virgil to oh. find and how stories can be healing towards the end of life and how to enhance that part of one's of life by recalling the stories. The, uh, it exists solely to help people tell their stories, review their life, record their stories, and le leave those stories to their loved ones. And if they're willing to leave them 
for our collection as part of the narrative histories of our town. Story Keepers believes that everybody has a unique story and that there's healing in being able to say your own story. When I was in the first grade, yes. I'm left-handed. Oh, yes. But the teacher tied my hand behind my back. Oh, goodness. She said, you can't use your left hand. And if I'd pick anything up, she'd come along and whack it with a ruler. She did that once too often. Because yes. when she hit me up, I just up and popped her. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> that whole experience of her saying that story, what I think there was more release. She's probably told that story several, many, many times. But I think World every War time II. it's a little more healing for World her. Could you tell us some of your stories? Well, the idea was to remember. That's right. And when you remember, mm -hmm. it was very painful. And I really do believe in the healing power of saying your own stories, listening to other people's stories. Well, my so there is a reconciliation within themselves when they have the a chance time. to because she had a say parts of their story. She, she worked hard baking. And she worked very hard. And that was all I could remember. Ira oh. knew that story was very important. And one of my favorite stories was his story when an older gentleman in the hospice house would not get along with anyone to such a degree that the nurses asked him as the doctor to come in and check to see if everything was medically okay. And while everything was okay, he, he casually asked he and his wife how they met. And that was the healing process. Because at that moment, they started talking about how they met. And it continued for days and days where they just started recalling their life story together. And the fellow lost that anger and was totally different, changed like a, the other side of a coin, and was congenial and, and uh, pleasant to be around. And that the story is what did the change. And so when, when the, the oh, Missoula no, no, Demonstration no, Project no, began no, no. to try to explore how we can help all this, that was definitely one of the ingredients to explore. How can we help one another express our stories and find healing? You don't know what's going to happen, but we're just going to have a circle time. Here with a story of his own is storyteller Walter Wongeren, Jr. Walt is a Lutheran pastor and author. I want to tell you a story about two members of my congregation. They were married. Her name was Mary Johnson and his name was Elijah Johnson. Elijah was a principal of a K through eight school. His wife Mary was a teacher in the third grade. If she were upset with a student in her third grade, and I had seen this happen, she would slowly turn from the blackboard. She would fix her shining eyes upon that student and say, Mr. Jones, you will pay attention to me. And that poor child would shiver, paying complete attention. In those days, the school system sold popcorn in almost all elementary schools. Bags of popcorn at 10 cents a bag. So did Delaware. Mr. Johnson, from the first day of school, would come to school with dimes in his pocket. Dimes, so that he would be able to bend his huge frame down and speak softly to children, tell them his name, ask them their names. And when they gave him his name, he would give them the dime that bought the bag of popcorn. He was a good man. Elijah always insisted that we end our meetings with the Lord's Prayer. After one such meeting, we walked out into the hallway of the school, talking to one another, he and I. And then I noticed that his body changed the posture and the rhythm and all the mood, as if suddenly I wasn't there. And I looked and I saw that he was looking at a young white child sitting down the hall with her back to the wall itself. Oh, Etta May, he said. Etta May is sad, he said, and I know why. She wants something, he said. And then this dear principal said the hard word. He said, but I can't give it to her. 
Annetta May opened her eyes wide, looked as if she were going to cry. At that very moment, he stepped down toward her and he knelt. He put his hand out. He said, I can't give you what you want, but I can give you the getting. He took her hand and he shook it. And when he pulled his great large hand away from her small paw, she had the getting in it. She had a dime. Etta May jumped up and ran with joy to buy her popcorn. Her principal didn't jump up right away. He said, come the Christmas holidays, I'm going into the hospital. He said, I've had a little pain in my side and we have it set up that I may have surgery early in the holidays and I'll be done, I'll be ready, and I'll be back in school when school starts again. When the children returned to Delaware school, Elijah was not there. He was here in a hospital bed. The surgeon had told us from the very beginning that this was not a routine piece of surgery. He said that it was delicate and that he could make no promises whatsoever, however Elijah chose to characterize it. The surgeon said that when they opened him up, they found that his entire body cavity had metastasized with the cancer and that many organs were involved and there was nothing they could do. All they could do was sew him up again. When Mary, his wife, heard that, she shot erect. This woman, who had been in control of everything, was suddenly not in control. When I would come to visit Elijah, Mary would be standing in the corner here, with her back against the wall and her arms folded, staring off and staring away. On a particular day, early in February, I came into the hospital room to a sight I had not seen before. Mary was no longer at her wall. She was leaning over Elijah, so close, so close that she must have been able to feel his heat. Their lips are only this far apart. She stroked him without touching him. She was running her hand in the air over his chest and almost trembling with what seemed to me to be affection. And then I made a sound and she snapped upright and she looked at me and that blazing anger returned and she went back to her position by the wall, folding her arms. But when she had gone to the wall, my friend Elijah began to laugh without opening his eyes, that gentle, embracing laugh. Oh, Mary, he said, calling her by name. Oh, my Mary, he said, she is so sad. When he said that, she, I could feel, stiffened even more. He said, she is so sad. Because she needs something, she wants something, he said. Now he was looking at me. And he said, I can't give it to her. And then he smiled. He said, but I can give her the getting. And then he put his big hand up. He took my hand. He looked me in the eye and he said, Pastor, pray with me pray the Lord's Prayer as if we were finishing some kind of very important meeting, and I did. It was three weeks later. Mary and I had been keeping a vigil watch for several days now, seven, in which he hadn't moved at all. There is such a thing as a death rattle. If you've never heard it before, when somebody begins to make that sound, you know what it is. It sounds like dry dice at the bottom of somebody's throat. Elijah began that death rattle sound. For the first time, Mary looked at me, and in her eye was a fright that I had never seen before. She was pleading. She wished there was something she could do. Then she came round to the side of the bed. She gathered his huge hand, buried her face in his hand, and she began to pray. She began to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom and when come. when she said, Amen. The death rattle had passed. Two days later, on the morning of that day, we celebrated the life and the faith of Mr. Elijah Johnson by holding funeral services here in this church, the same church in which he had worshiped for much of his life. The entire congregation came to honor him. So did many friends from the city, not just teachers, but people who honored and respected this man. Last of all, came Mary Johnson and her children. She had been so angry. She'd been angry at so many. Angry at me, 
was clear, and I think it was partly because I stood for authority. I stood for those who should make things go right in this world. She was angry at her God, that Jehovah, who allowed a husband to die too soon and too quick and through too much pain. And I think she'd been angry as well at Elijah. I preached. I preached about the merciful God that Elijah consistently saw as the God of the whole universe and the God who held kindness and love and forgiveness for all of the people. Not this Jehovah that Mary had known. And then we pray. Just at the time when we would begin the Lord's Prayer, I heard a commotion in the congregation, and this was not usual. I turned and I found that Mary herself had stood up. She looked at me, and without anger, without the power and the willfulness of those eyes, she smiled as if one good thing had happened and another good thing was just about to happen. She looked at me and then she turned and looked at the entire congregation. She said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And the entire congregation raised its arms and prayed with her and so did I, and so did I, as she sang us sweetly home past her grief to amen, to amen, and to forgiveness. How do you deal with racially motivated killing? Can you go back and forgive the massacre of your people? And finally, how do you find healing after modern massacres, what we call terrorism? When we return, we'll continue this journey. On this journey toward forgiveness, we now meet John Perkins. John grew up in rural Mississippi in the 30s, raised by his grandmother when his mother died and his father abandoned them. In his life, he would face down death in the midst of overwhelming racism. We live in very much poverty, what it was like in Mississippi. But the best years of, of our life during our childhood is when my uncle and my brother went into the service because my grandmother got a check. John's brother Clyde survived World War II but came home to another war on the home front. He couldn't adjust neatly again, going over there to fight for freedom and democracy for the world, and then to come back into this tight, closed, Racia society. And so he and his girlfriend were standing in line at a theater waiting to go up in the back of it. That's where blacks had to stay. He was talking to his girlfriend. This sheriff walked up behind him and hit him. And then he turned around and caught the club. And this man uh, shot him two times in the stomach. His brother died from the wounds. So John's family encouraged him to leave Mississippi where there was so much racial tension. John moved to California where he became a pastor. Gradually, he became convinced that he needed to return to Mississippi and work among his own people. But the early 70s were still a tough time to get racial justice in Mississippi, and John participated in organizing an economic boycott. He was briefly jailed in Mendenhall, and then some students were arrested in nearby Brandon. John went to post bail. It was three of us. They started beating us before we got in there. And then uh, in there, when we got in there, uh, the sheriff began to curse us and say, this is that smart nigga, uh, and this is a new ball game now. This is not Mendenhall. Uh, you are in uh, uh, my county now. And uh, they began to beat us and, and torture us. One of the uh, sheriffs took a, uh, a pistol and cocked it to my, to my uh, put it side of my head. And, and, and pull the trigger. Of course, it wasn't no bullet, and it, it, it didn't, didn't go off. But I mean, in my mind, I was a dead person. Through the pain and terror he was experiencing that night, John formulated a clear vision for his future. I was fearful. I was thinking I was gonna be killed, and I was making a bargain with God. I said, God, if you let me out of this jail, uh, I really want to preach a gospel that is stronger than my race, that's stronger than my economic interests. I want to preach a gospel that can reconcile. Before he could preach that gospel, he had to go through an inner reconciliation of his own. The burden 
and the anguish, the, the, the hatred. I saw that in the eyes of the people that was torturing me in that jail. And I saw that hate, and that hate scared me. And I could feel myself needing to hate them back because of that hatred. And during those days after my beating in the Brandon jail, the pain and the agony of being in the hospital, and I could almost sense that it was a weight on me. And it really wasn't until I began to recognize the fact and hear that scripture that said, unless you can forgive those who trespass against you, how do you expect your heavenly father to forgive you? And so I began to see that forgiveness was my way of shedding the reaction, hatred in my own life. It's not so much for the sheriff. Reconciliation to me is not so much for the white people that I need to be reconciled to. It is really for myself. After his near-death experience, John made good on his promise. In the last 40 years, he helped start a community development project, including a daycare center, youth programs, adult education programs, and an association for similar organizations. His work has come full circle in that he's now working with the current local sheriff to help offenders get established when they get out of prison. Sometimes you meet somebody and your chemistry just jive. And so he started talking to me about the idea of why don't we get together and try to organize uh, some churches to both work with them on the inside and on the outside and that he would work with us. It would be a joint venture. They would send the prison out to work in the community with us to help build houses and do things in the community. And, and they come in here and stay two or three years. They're now 17, 18 years old and, and, and never had no work experience. Exactly. And we would go inside there with the discipleship and discipline. I'm also going to motivate the organizations out here both the white congregation and black congregation to really surround these young people so that we can reduce this, this prison population. This is um, outside, a, a, something that is really inside. exciting to me now. That this whole program can affect a lot of people's lives. I think it would just mean a lot, the very fact that um, I would be working with a local sheriff to pull something like this off. I think it could capture people uh, imagination. John works to inspire others to reconciliation, a legacy from the night of his near-death bargain with God. I have been loved. Not only have I been loved by God, but I've been loved by God's people. And I've seen God's people as an agent of that, of, 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 of that love. And, uh, and, and of course, now I want to do that too. I want to be that agent now to others. And it's a freeing experience. The saddest people that I know is people who is not able to forgive. Our next story looks at the challenge of whether forgiving means losing the memories and legacy of our loved ones. It is uh, possible uh, to forgive, uh, but to always remember what happened at Sand Creek and at the Washita. Lawrence Hart is a Cheyenne peace chief who has wrestled with how to forgive the murder and massacre of his ancestors. Does forgiving mean forgetting? One person Lawrence remembers is White Antelope, a Cheyenne peace chief in the 1800s. I see him as uh, one of my role models. He followed the teachings of sweet medicine that chiefs are to be Peacemakers, they are not to engage in any controversy or use any violence. And peace chiefs are to do that no matter what the cost. White Antelope was one of the first persons shot in the massacre at Sand Creek in the southeastern portion of Colorado Territory in 1860. The troops began to uh, shoot indiscriminately. Innocent women, children, and even infants were slaughtered. Parts of the bodies 
uh, including scalps, were eventually uh, paraded through the streets of Denver. For Lawrence, one way to work toward healing these deep wounds and terrible wrongs is by caring for the bodies of his ancestors, people who were violated and slain. This process, called repatriation, involves taking bones which have been on display in a museum and returning them to their tribes for burial. The whole uh, process of repatriation was given the title Na Ivaho Tsem. It means we are going back home. A few years ago, the pain and emotions of the Sand Creek Massacre resurfaced for the Cheyenne people during a burial ceremony. It was especially very difficult um, to handle the remains of this 10 to 12 year old uh, female victim. Cheyenne people have uh, a great fondness uh, for children. And in fact, they, they cherish children as much as they do their elders. Repatriation has become a meaningful way for Lawrence to work at healing, almost literally burying his anger and bitterness as he lays to rest the bodies of his people. But it was the commemoration of another tragedy that became even more personal for Lawrence. The massacre at Washita River happened one dawn in late November 1868, when Colonel Custer and 800 troops of the 7th U.S. Cavalry attacked the peaceful Cheyenne village here on the banks of the Washita River. 100 years later, the townspeople of Cheyenne planned a centennial observance of their town's history. They wanted the Cheyenne people to play the part of their embattled ancestors in a reenactment of the Battle of Washita. Reluctantly, the Cheyenne agreed to participate if the town would give up bones of a Cheyenne victim they had on display in a museum to be properly buried as part of the day's commemoration. As the bugle sounded, uh, I heard some commotion to my right. And when I looked over there, I saw a small detachment of troops. And it turned out that they were members of the Grand Army of the Republic, the grandsons of the 7th. Cavalry. I had not known that they were coming. They were dressed in authentic 7th Cavalry uniforms, on horses, and firing blank cartridges from their rifles. I detested their presence. And I didn't appreciate that they were shooting at our people once again, 100 years later and especially shooting at my own biological children. I almost had the regret that I had asked my two children, Connie and Nathan, to be there. The reenactment ended. It was now time to bury the bones of the Cheyenne killed in the original battle. The soldiers saluted the coffin of the bones of the Cheyenne who was to be buried. I thought, how dare they do that? How dare they? salute one that their grandfathers had killed. And again, all this time, I, I knew that I should not harbor such feelings. Then one of the Cheyenne women, as was traditional, took a beautiful blanket from around her shoulders to cover the coffin. It was also traditional to present such a coffin covering as an honor to someone at the burial. And I had in my mind, uh, knowing who was there that perhaps one of the dignitaries from our state government uh, who were present uh, would receive that blanket. Lawrence huddled with the chiefs and they told him who they wanted to receive the blanket. And I thought, wow, why are they doing this? Nonetheless, I obeyed my elders and, and I went back to the microphone and I called the captain of the regiment to step forward to receive this blanket. Lawrence took the blanket and placed it on the shoulders of the captain, a grandson of the original soldiers. And that was just a, a most 
uh, dramatic uh, moment. And it was caught by other people as signaling a reconciliation that had been initiated by the elder peace chiefs who were there. And it was a very emotional moment for many people. Later, the captain thanked Lawrence, and he took an oval pin off his uniform. It was the Gary Owen pin worn originally by the members of the 7th Cavalry. Gary Owen was the music that was played to signal an attack, and it was played that morning 100 years ago. And he told me, I want you to take this pin on behalf of the Cheyenne people with the assurance that never again will your people hear Gary Owen. And that concluded our day. A day that I will always remember. A day that I learned what it means to be a Cheyenne Peace Chief. Lawrence learned from the elders in his community that taking care of the bones of his dead ancestors wasn't the only important thing. The elders had also taught him the importance of reconciliation in the process of healing. It is possible uh, to forgive, uh, but to always remember it was kind of a metamorphosis to, to reach that point where now I can discuss Sand Creek and Washita, still with, with some emotion, but not with any uh, bitterness uh, or any type of uh, hatred for the people who perpetrated these tasks on our ancestors. Lawrence Hart gives us one key to moving on after a terrible atrocity. Forgive, but remember. Bud Welch remembers the grief and rage he experienced after the death of his daughter Julie in the Oklahoma City bombing. I couldn't imagine what had taken place. When the bomb went off, I thought that probably an airplane had crashed. Four or five minutes after that, my telephone rang, and it was one of my younger brothers. And he asked me if my television was on, and I told him it wasn't. He said, turn it on. He said, something has happened downtown. The traffic helicopters were, were still in the air from the television stations, from the morning rush. And one of them was focusing in on the Murrah building from the north. And when they did, I could see the, all of the face of the Murrah building completely gone. And Frank was still on the phone, and I said to him, I said, Frank, my God, I said, it's not the federal courthouse, it's the Murrah building. And I said, and it is totally destroyed, and I said, and Julie works in that building on the first floor. When I saw that, that three-story pile of rubble, I, I frankly gave up any hope that Julie could have survived at that, at that moment. In her senior year, she... Uh, Won a foreign language scholarship to Marquette University in Milwaukee, and we were unloading the truck. We were almost completely finished, and I reached in and got this teddy bear and handed it to Julie as I was ha had been handing everything else to her. She snatches the bear from my hands, and she slings it violently back into the truck. It goes all the way up into the windshield and drops in the pasture side floorboard. And she said to me, she said, don't put that damn bear out here. Well, I couldn't quite figure out what was going on. We finished unloading the truck, and after we did, she goes back out where her items are. In fact, we were piling them on the grass. We were waiting for a cart. She pulls this large bath towel out, climbs in the back of the truck, takes the teddy bear and rolls it up in this bath towel. Well, I realized what was going on at that moment. You had this grown freshman that was going off to college and didn't want all of these other grown freshmen to see that this one had brought her teddy bear to college with her. 
and I nicknamed that beer Dam Bear after that. And so all through college, why, uh, quite often I would ask her when I was talking to her on the phone, I'd say, oh, Julie, how's Dam Bear? And, of course, typically she wouldn't even respond to that question. And uh, I only did it because I knew that it would annoy her. And uh, I... Uh, when Julie was killed on April the 19th, 1995, and when we buried her, well, Dan Bear is with her today. We put Dan Bear in Julie's casket. After Julie was killed, the absolute rage and revenge that went through me was, was gripping. I look back on the first four to five weeks after the bombing, and I now call it a, a period of temporary insanity. We often hear it used in the court system. Uh, someone had temporary insanity. Most of us uh, scoff at the idea. We say it's some slick defense attorney just trying to get someone off of a crime. Temporary insanity is real. I know it is because I've lived it. I had uh, started drinking and drinking heavier and heavier and heavier. I was a smoker then, smoke, went, reached the point of smoking three packs a day. And by the end of January of 1996, I was literally hung over, if you will, 24 hours a day. And I went to the bomb site every single day after Julie had been killed. And this one particular day at the end of the Jan end of January that I went, I was, I was mentally sick and I was very physically sick also. I was stuck on April the 19th, 1995, and I needed to move forward some way and I, I was unable to do that. So I went to asking myself the question, what's it gonna take? Do we need the trials to begin? Do we need convictions? And do we need executions? And struggling with that question for two or three weeks after feeling the rage and revenge that I had, I finally realized that Julie and 167 others were dead in that great city because of rage and revenge. It was McVeigh and Nichols' rage against the federal government for what had happened at Waco, Texas on April the 19th, 1993. And after being able to start sorting that out and start reconciling things, I was able to get my, my health back in shape, even reached the point to where a little over two years ago I even quit smoking cigarettes after 42 years. And I had remembered seeing Bill McVeigh on television during those first few weeks, that insanity period I spoke of. And the reporter was asking him a series of questions. Bill was giving a series of answers, of which I don't recall any of them. But I do recall at one, at one moment in answering a question that Bill stood up almost straight up and looked into the lens of the television camera. And when he did, what I could see was a, a quite a large man physically stooped in grief. And I could see a deep pain in his eyes. And I think most other people didn't recognize that pain, but I did because I was living that pain. And I knew that someday I needed, for my own sanity, to go tell him that I truly cared how he felt and that I did not blame him or his family for what his son had done. About three years later, Bud got his chance to meet Bill McVeigh. When I knocked on his door, the first question I asked him, I said, Bill, I understand that you have a large garden in your backyard. Uh, if you'd have put a spotlight on this man's face, you could not have lit him up anymore. And he did not seem the least bit shy to me at that moment. And he, he just simply said to me, yeah, he said, would you like to see it? I knew that he and I would find common ground, these two old men out there in the garden kicking dirt clods around. And we did. We spent a half hour there getting to know one another, found out he was the I think the fifth generation of McVeigh's in Western New York, Irish Catholic. I'm the third generation of Welch's in Central Oklahoma, Irish Catholic. So that was common ground for us. Bud and Bill McVeigh went inside and sat down with Bill's daughter, Jennifer. And there was this wall right next to the table that had some family photos on it, just mainly snapshots. And the largest picture on that wall was an eight by 10 of Tim. During this hour and a half that we're visiting, periodically I'm glancing at the wall and I'm doing it too many times. And I'm starting to feel self-conscious about it, wanting to know what they think that I'm thinking. And so finally, when I caught myself the next time, I, I just simply looked at, the, uh, looked at the picture and I said, I said, God, what a good looking kid. 
Well, there was silence in that kitchen when I said that. Well, after the silence ended, Bill looked at the wall and he just simply said, that's Tim's high school graduation picture. But when he did, this big old tear rolled out of his right eye. I got ready to leave and when I did, I shook Bill's hand. I extended my hand to Jennifer and she didn't take my hand, she hugged me. Well, I'm not like Bill, I can cry pretty easily. And so we, uh, we started crying. I started sobbing, I can remember that very well. And it was like a, an uncontrolled sob. You don't know where you're going next or how to get out of it. So I just took her face in my hands and I just simply said to her, honey, the three of us are in this for the rest of our lives and we can make the most of it if we choose. I don't want your brother to die and I'll do everything that I can to prevent it. And uh, we embraced again and I left and I sobbed for probably 45 minutes after I left their home. But after I went through that process, and I call it a process because it was not a single event, it was as if this huge weight had been removed from my shoulders. And I've never felt closer to God than I did at that moment. What I found in Western New York that Saturday morning was a bigger victim of the Oklahoma City bombing than myself. While Bud was ultimately unable to keep Tim McVeigh from being executed, he maintains his relationship with the family and continues his work toward ending the cycle of rage and revenge. I do this in memory of my daughter Julie and 167 others, victims of the bombing, and also in memory of, uh, of Tim McVeigh, the, uh, the convicted. Like Bud, in the early days following the Oklahoma City bombing, many of us are just beginning a raw and difficult journey out of rage, grief, and fear. Bud and others who have shared their stories of deep and personal pain plant seeds of hope for all of us. To order a copy of this program, call 800-999-3534. The preceding program was a production of the National Council of Churches. <laughs>